I'm Josh Hammer. I'm Ina Stepman. I'm Ben Weingarten. I'm Emily Trushinsky. And this is NatCon Squad, where common good and common sense meet. NatCon Squad is produced by the Edmund Burke Foundation, the home for national conservatism. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. So welcome back, everyone. We have a typically wide-ranging course of topics to get to today, so I will kick us off by talking about the case that is being argued today, the day that we are recording this episode of the U.S. Supreme Court. That is the case of Gonzalez versus Google. It is a seminal or at least potentially seminal case in big tech in Section 230. Then we are going to kick it over to Ben, who is going to talk about a particularly pernicious equity-based executive order from the Biden administration. We will then turn to Inez. We'll talk about the coming generation war and a wonderful term here, DEI conservatism. If you think that's Nazi moron, just stay tuned. And then Emily will take us home by talking about, uh, I guess, Nikki Haley's presidential announcement run next week, kind of and the opening of the floodgates for the 2024 uh, fracas that is to follow. So let's kick us off here by diving into Gonzalez versus Google. So this is a hotly anticipated oral argument. Um, I, you know, unfortunately, Rachel cannot be here, I guess, to provide her, her particularly incisive and unique cutting edge commentary on this particular issue here. Um, you know, right, right off the top, I will just kind of do a shameless promotion and flag for you a couple of wonderful op-eds. We've run a Newsweek on this topic. So Joel Thayer had a good piece on this. Just last Friday, actually, our friend Theo Walt had a great op-ed on this particular topic as well here. So long story short, um, you know, this is the Supreme Court's first opportunity in a very long time to definitively try to interpret the scope of the immunity, the scope of the liability shield that Section 230 provides. So here is kind of the direct, I'm just going to read it actually, this is kind of the direct QP, what lawyers call it, it's the direct question presented to the Supreme Court. So uh, it reads, quote, whether Section 230, subsection C1 of the Communications Decency Act immunizes interactive computer services when they make targeted recommendations of information provided by another information content provider or only limits the liability of interactive computer services when they engage in traditional editorial functions with regard to such information. So to kind of cut away the legalese here, we're basically just trying to determine the actual scope of what the so-called Good Samaritan provision, which is broadly kind of subsection C of the statute, how much liability the big tech platforms actually have here. And this has been an issue crying out for judicial intervention for a very long time. It's frankly also been an issue crying out for lawmaking policy intervention. There's only so much that the Supreme Court can properly do to, to actually interpret uh, Section 230's immunity shield properly. That, you know, Congress really, ideally speaking, would kind of take, and take this into its own hands. We kind of know how, how that goes uh, in today's kind of, uh, you know, era of Bismarckian sausage making, and it's probably not going to go very far here. So, as it currently stands, the, the the predominant case law when it comes to Section 230 is sweeping immunity. Um, and now there, there have been various kind of state courts in recent years, and there have, there have actually been some kind of lower federal appellate courts. So the Fifth Circuit in a case called Net Choice versus Paxton, I think we discussed it on this show, was a wonderful opinion written by Trump nominee Judge Andy Oldham, who was a fantastic legal mind. He had this really, really excellent opinion um, on Texas's state level big tech law. This came out last September. Um, it, it was it was kind of just a wonderful kind of attacking of, of kind of what is speech, what is publisher. And um, it was really kind of a, a really a piece of judicial masterpiece. You, the longtime listeners and watchers of this program will recall we actually did kind of a special episode after Justice Clarence Thomas had a concurrence in April 2021 in a case called Biden versus Knight First Amendment Institute. Justice Thomas kind of uh, concurred, and then he had like a separate unique writing where he kind of detailed the various ways that the court has has either misconstrued or just failed to actually construe in the first instance um, the scope of, of, of Section 230 here. So, um, I, you know, I, we've discussed Section 230 on the show a lot. I don't necessarily feel a need to kind of like rehash like like the basic arguments here. But the point here, the point here is that the the idea, the idea that big tech is not a publisher in any way whatsoever, and you know, it is purely kind of a, a third party interactive computer service that makes no editorial thumb on the scale whatsoever is active hogwash. And the particular kind of fact pattern here of this of this case, which I guess I guess I've neglected to mention thus far, I, I guess kind of drives that home a little bit. So the actual fact pattern here, the plaintiffs are the family of someone who was horrifically murdered by ISIS. 
And what they are basically arguing is that the algorithms from Google in particular via its YouTube sub subsidiary um, did not make any effort whatsoever to kind of diminish the metastasis of ISIS videos, which ultimately helped potentially lead uh, this jihadist or just jihadists in general to take this particular action. So, you know, uh, from 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 Google's perspective, they're basically obviously saying, you know, hands off, we're immune, the algorithms are what they are here. But maybe the algorithms are not what they are. You know, maybe in today's day and age, you know, it would not necessarily be the worst idea in the world for what the statue refers to as interactive computer services, be that Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Google, whatever, actually treat their algorithm, their search manipulations as some sort of kind of publisher-esque thing where they where they are where, where they are potentially liable for making traditional publisher functions. So that latter kind of conclusion there, where they're held, um, at least for kind of algorithm search manipulation kind of things, they're, they are held to be uh, equivalent to publishers for those decisions and therefore legally liable like publishers. That, I think, is what Joel Thayer basically concluded in his Newsweek op-ed in the subject. That is personally what I would like to see happen out of this case as well. But, um, I, you know, on that note, I'll throw it out to you. I, 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 will, I should quickly add here, um, we're literally recording this just a couple hours after oral arguments started. The scuttlebutt, um, frankly, is that the plaintiff's lawyer has not done a particularly good job. I have actually heard that Justice Alito and Justice Katanji Brown-Jackson, so opposite ideological sides of the court, are, are openly saying to this counsel, I have no idea what you're asking. So it, it appears to be off to an inauspicious start. Um, but on that note, I'm kind of just open to whatever you guys think about this case. Yeah, this is a really interesting case for all the reasons Josh mentioned, and also because of, uh, as Josh mentioned as well, the Clarence Thomas factor here. He's come out and talked about the common carrier suggestion, and when you're looking at this particular case, an algorithm and a uh, an algorithm kind of aggregator, an algorithmic aggregator like Google, um, acting as a publisher, but only not as a publisher because our definition of publisher has been traditionally technologically defined by tech that is now outdated and old, it's just important to see the court start to grapple with that and to see it happen in the arguments. Um, I haven't had a chance to tune in yet, but to to hear the questions, it'll be too bad if the plaintiff isn't doing a great job because these are really serious questions um, that have a huge bearing on the media, but they have a huge bearing on big tech's future. I always think it's important to mention that companies like Facebook have actually been lobbying for Section 230 reform for a couple of years now, because as Tim Carney writes in The Big Ripoff so well, they're the big guys. They know that they can sort of weather the regulatory burden that they can shape because they are the big guys. They have huge presences here in Washington. They know they can shape that regulatory burden. They know they can weather it better than any other potentially potential competitors to the extent those even are allowed to exist. Um, so Section 230 is something they're sort of prepared to deal with, but the court isn't um, you know, issuing regulation in a way that tech can lobby and shape. Um, so it obviously is a bit much bigger threat, I think, than any legislation legislation that would potentially come out of Congress. So just a huge, huge, huge case to pay attention to. These are these companies are obviously acting as publishers. There's no way around that at this point. They write headlines, they choose story selection, they fact check. Um, so they're in for a much needed reckoning. I don't know if this case will give it to them, but we'll at least see that argument be made. Yeah, I think Emily's final point is maybe I would just underscore and maybe the most important one. Uh, manifestly, these are all publishing companies in one way or another. They control the content that is disseminated. They control who can see it, what they see. I guess they outsource the fact checking now to some extent, for example, like in a Twitter where users can comment and provide their own fact checks. Many of these entities, of course, also try to outsource to, quote unquote, disinformation watchdogs and the like. Uh, as we've seen in reporting we discussed last week, which is probably a way to try to get around any potential liability, I suspect. They've also tried to create various boards to deal with content moderation and decisions around who can speak and what they can say. The fact of the matter is oftentimes these are distinctions without differences. They are controlling what you see, how much you see of it, and then modifications to it in real time. So they are manifestly publishers. And then the question becomes, but is this the case that is likely to yield the controlling opinion at the end of the day that ultimately serves as kind of the death knell of these being 
publishers, but not in name, to actually being treated the way they ought to be, so we have some recourse and remedy when they act in tyrannical ways. And I'm not sure that this is the case that's going to rise to the level. I will look forward to reading Justice Thomas's opinion, whichever way he comes down. And I suspect he will write the truth and the important truth about common carrier, uh, but still are to decide this case on the merits. So let's see if the court ends up following in his footsteps or if this isn't the case where Thomas is really able to fully make his mark on this issue. Yeah, I completely agree with what Ben just said. Um, I'm more interested in what Thomas writes about this uh, essentially as dicta than the way that this case actually uh, gets decided. Um, and regardless, like Section 230 reform, I don't think is going to be sufficient to deal with this problem, in in part because um, the, the kind of woke capital and censorship problem extends well beyond anything that could conceivably be called a publisher, right? Um, Airbnb just you know, dropped uh, Lauren Southern's parents uh, as clients for 48 hours. They weren't able to book an Airbnb because they happened to be the parents of a right-wing commentator. Um, this problem has extended well, well beyond even anything that conceivably could be covered even by a um, a more, uh, you know, updated for the digital age uh, interpretation of who, who's a publisher. Um, so, I mean, I can see a lot of routes of dealing with this. Um, potentially, there, there are different kinds of precedent common carrier obviously um as mentioned just as thomas has, has pointed to the possibility of common carrier um of treating these companies as common carriers i think there's there's kind of a dead end precedent um that uh i think might be a potential way to revive some of this stuff uh and that is a company town precedent for uh, basically enforcing certain limited constitutional rights in the situation where a private space has become so much like a traditional public square um, and a uh, traditional public spot um, that some constitutional protections are applicable. Uh, and then finally, um, before, before we transition to the next subject here, my preferred sort of framework for this uh, really is too bad that Will Chamberlain isn't here this week, but because um, this is, I think, his initial idea but it's, it's public accommodation um, because increasingly, I think the coordination between these companies is what's the problem, right? Um, there, there are individual problems with Twitter, with Facebook, with Google, right? But the problem is that once you get canceled from one of them, you get canceled off of all of these different platforms. And then you really do lose your ability uh, to speak in, in the digital public square. So there's a, a cultural collusion aspect of this that looks a little bit like something in the economic context would be considered antitrust, but this is sort of in the cultural and not in the the um, economic collusion. So I, I don't know that it quite fits under antitrust, but I think the point being here, 230, this case is not going to change the world. Um, it, it hopefully will update this definition of publisher to be more consonant in a digital age, um, but it's not really gonna change the entire landscape for that. We are going to have to have legislation and potential re reinterpretation of one of many, at least, uh, legal doctrines regarding recognizing the power that these companies actually exercise over the digital public square. Yeah, legislation, judicial reinterpretation, and I would only also add potentially actually direct uh, uh, regulation. So, I mean, it's possible that at least I've argued that Title II um, could actually directly be applied to the common carrier framework here with big tech. But let's call that aside for now because we're out of time here. So, Ben, why don't you tell us about Biden's equity executive order? Yes, well, while the legislative branch dithers and punts everything to a judiciary that's usurped, I think we'd probably all agree, probably far more power than was ever anticipated, the executive branch also does the same. And so the Biden administration on February 16th put out a sort of equity executive order 2.0, building upon the first day of the Biden administration executive order on affirmatively advancing equity. This one titled Executive Order on Further Advancing Racial Equity and Support for Undeserved Communities Through the Federal Government. So one thing that's worth noting at the outset is it's kind of amazing how commonplace and mundane these sorts of executive actions have become. But you can also see the ruling ideology of the state and the way that it codifies that ideology manifesting itself in DEI pledges at universities and the various administrative bodies in basically every influential institution in our society at this point that mimic what the federal government is doing by way of executive orders like the one the Biden administration just promulgated. So what does that executive order entails? A, a few of the highlights, the development of agency equity teams that must be established within virtually every major agency, a White House steering committee 
an equity has now been created to be chaired by Susan Rice, who I've speculated in the past is probably the hidden hand behind basically the entirety of the Biden domestic agenda as the head of the Domestic Policy Council and essentially, in my view, Barack Obama's principal within the administration. And that steering committee is is tasked with coordinating government-wide efforts to advance equity, including on age, within each agency, uh, and their mandated equity action plan. So now each year there will be an annual equity action plan for each agency to produce, purportedly to be publicly disclosed, although the administration has hidden these sorts of plans in the past. It'll be interesting to see them, uh, but also to coordinate on other plans like the initiatives that the administration has put forth via executive actions on quote unquote environmental justice, gender policy, and a slew of other identity specific initiatives. Uh, the director of the OMB shall also, and I'm quoting here directly, consider opportunities to review and update internal processes, directives, and government-wide guidance to support equitable decision-making, promote equitable deployment of financial and technical assistance, and assist agencies in advancing equity as appropriate and wherever possible. And I should pause just to note here, you should read through these executive orders, although it's mind-numbing and your eyes will glaze over, but the fact that you have one bureaucracy after another and the language that's used here and reinforced that's basically unintelligible, despite the definitions provided at the end, which are often self-referential, really exposes kind of how Marxian this entire regime is at this point. Uh, and then it's also worth noting as well that this equity executive order calls on a slew of policies involving working with outside groups, civil society groups. So this is a the kind of public-private wokest uh, infrastructure that's being put in place, including coordinating with a group titled Justice 40, which aims to get 40% of the overall benefits of certain federal investments, I'm qu quoting here from federal website, to flow to disadvantaged communities that are marginalized, underserved, and overburdened by pollution. Categories of investment are climate change, clean energy, and energy efficiency, and the like. So all of this goes to channeling money to favored constituencies and effectively, to put it in crass terms, vote buying, uh, then the creation of this and the codification of this entire woke infrastructure, administrative infrastructure within an already like-minded administrative state and tasking officers within all of these agencies by executive order with implement developing, implementing, promulgating such orders and all related policies and processes and practices associated with them. So you know, a, a couple of questions that come to mind in looking at this are first, why? Why put this out uh, at this point in the Biden administration? They already had an equity executive order. So why make it even more robust uh, and rigorous in its response? Secondly, what's the conservative response to this? Can we be purely defensive here about basically saying the next president has to tear this out root and branch? Can you ever really uh, extricate this kind of rot? from the system when it's being so firmly embedded throughout the entirety of an administrative state that is already overwhelmingly leftist. Uh, and then, you know, what should a Republican president do with that executive branch, given those limitations? What should be done at the state level? What legislatively should be done to combat it? And how do we get beyond the idea of simply oversight and defunding of such agencies? What's the next step of actually putting forth a positive plan? In other words, another way of stating this is, what would be the conservative response to an e affirmatively advancing equity executive order? What's our executive order? What are we affirmatively advancing? And so I'd put all those questions out, not rhetorically, to the group for, for comment and thought. Well, um, I'll jump in here and say uh, that the, the play, playing field has been lopsided for a very, very long time, right? So a large part of the professional left is funded directly by by government. Um, and here I'm not only just talking about the grants that Ben is laying out, the fact that the administrative state is essentially funneling money to preferred constituencies, to um, the NGO complex, right? Uh, but, but, but also the fact that the institutions that are funded in a quote unquote neutral way. So for example, our entire higher ed system, more or less with very few exceptions like Bob Jones and Hillsdale, right? Um, is is completely dependent on federally backed student loans, right? That that those are trillions of tax dollars that are going to back an institution that is functionally playing in politics for the left. Um, and the same thing is true in K-12, that's $800 billion annually. We need to seize our portion of this, 
tax money. And we need to actually put it towards building conservative institutions, at least in education, right? This is why I think school choice is so important. It's not only about allowing people to escape. It's also about reallocating public funds to institutions that are not at a minimum, not hostile to conservatives. And in many cases, now we are rebuilding, right? Something like classical education. Uh, that's really, really important because it's almost like it, we don't think about, we think about only about the private money in play. There are literally trillions of dollars backing all of these professional leftist organizations. Um, and, and that's, I think, really important to to think about when we think about what what a positive agenda would look like what our dei order would look like but the other point i wanted to make is that you know, there's been a lot of talk of peak wokeness um, which i think is ridiculous right um that this order would come out that establishes what, what we're seeing is the final consolidation institutional consolidation of this ideology and therefore they can kind of back off some of the rhetoric and the radical rhetoric um we're seeing for example, fewer academic papers published with DEI buzzwords. Well, they don't need to do that anymore. They have a DEI directive from the highest office in the land. Um, so I think a lot of what people are interpreting as, as this kind of slowing down or peaking is actually just it becoming standardized best practices in institutions and therefore not, you know, the chatter of the, of the avant-garde faculty lounge. Um, so I, I think that that's a, that's a giant bit of of cope, I think, on, on the part of people who are imagining that this is slowing down in any way. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's very well said by Inez. I guess, you know, Ben specifically said, I guess one thing that I'll very briefly address here before giving it over to Emily for her time is, you know, Ben said, like, what could a Republican administration potentially do next? I mean, I'm just like kind of spitballing here. I'm thinking back to like the very end of the Trump administration. I'm thinking back to, you know, kind of the the Russ vote kind of um, led initiative when it came to critical race theory in the administration. I mean, the next Republican administration, you know, call it the, I, I don't know, the 1776 executive order um, or the, or the, uh, uh, the I, I don't know, something like that, right? Or the Americanist executive order. And it's like, uh, it would be basically be like a systemic kind of sweeping vow across the entirety of the administrative state bureaucracy to never take race, sexual orientation, sex, uh, immigration, that, blah, 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 you know, the whole nine yards into account when making personnel decisions. So, you know, that might be some sort of potentially tangible rebuttal. I had the same thought, actually, which is very convenient because we're running low on time as Josh. I immediately thought of the 1776 kind of thing. And, um, you know, I just I finished uh, the Christopher Caldwell book finally while I was off last week on vacation. Uh, great beach read. Just the the pleasant uh, escapism that you want when you're on the beach. Um, but I think obviously uh, dismantling the administrative state is uh, in, a, in and of itself a way for us to return to some semblance of neutrality neutrality with the, the principle of sort of constitutional republicanism affirmatively baked into it, of course. Um, but that's a, you know, a, apart from putting that into curricula or whatever, um, you know, obviously a government where we're disempowering the administration to uh, put its heavy hand on the scale and basically every moment of everyone's life um, is one that is getting back to a better place. So on that, I'll toss it over to you, Inez. You are uh, muted. Yeah. I was hoping you wouldn't say it, and then, and then we would have been able to cover the, the little silence here. Um, yes, still several years later, problems with the mute button. Um, no, so I, I wanted to speak about this uh, sort of exchange over the last week over Nikki Haley, right? They have this Don, Don Lemon exchange at CNN where um, Nikki Haley is selling herself as a new generation of leadership, um, and she is in her early 50s. Um, and Don Lemon kind of made some comments about how that's not true, like it should be 20s or 30s to be in, in a new generation. Um, and then there was this very, very lame response um, from the right uh Regrettably, some some uh, institutions that are otherwise, uh, you know, on our team, things like Fox News, for example, ran, you know, program after program, uh, episode after episode, right, segment after segment, basically saying Nikki Haley makes heads explode uh, by being the first minority woman governor. Um, so Orrin McIntyre over on Twitter, I think, has coined an excellent phrase for this, and that's DEI conservatism. Um, Nikki Haley launched her uh, launched her um, campaign, basically citing her checkbox credentials. Um, this is something 
that we really need to stop doing on the right. Um, it is a weak frame. Uh, it, it buys into all of the premises of the left, um, and it, it doesn't impress anyone. I, I, I really think that it's it's ineffective in terms of a strategy for minority outreach. And as we know, uh, you know, Trump did better with Hispanic voters than um, Romney did, despite you know, kind of uh, bowing to a lot of this language uh, in in his campaign literature and so on. Um, there isn't really a lot of evidence that it it, it actually shifts minority voters at all. Um, and and it's embarrassing, frankly. I, I think it's embarrassing for the right uh, to continue this kind of language. Uh, she also played the the, the woman card, right? Uh, it was apparently sexist for Don Lemon to point out that 51 is not the new generation of leadership. Um, and so there was that response as well. And, and all of this kind of DEI conservatism, I'll, I'll kick it out to the group in a minute on, I, I really do think that it's it, it smacks of Dems are the real racists um, and it really doesn't work. I think it's rhetoric that doesn't work. I think it's it's a weak posture uh, that we just need to excise from, from the conservative movement, especially when it leads us to pick bad candidates uh, because we're so thirsty and desperate to check those boxes. And I think George Santos is a perfect example of that, right? Um, he was, he was a sort of racist up by Elise Stefanik and other people in Republican establishment because he was um, a minority gay Republican. Well, it turns out the guy's a serial fabulist and a liar, right? Like, that should have been a little more important than making sure that we uh, um, check those boxes for the left. Uh, but I do want to make one point about this exchange, which Whoopi Goldberg followed up and said, no, 51 is, is not actually the new generation. Um, Don Lemon was right about this. Um, I do think this is kind of the first shot in a generational war that will become very, very important in our politics, where essentially we're seeing that Gen X is turning um, conservative in much higher numbers. Like, uh, So at the same age, boomers were still more liberal. Um, they still voted more Democrat at the same age than Gen X is now taking a sharp turn right um, so I really think if you think about like up and coming uh, dynamic Republican leaders, the new generation of the Republican Party, they are Gen X. They're people in their late 30s through their mid 50s right now. And that Nikki Haley is not a dynamic leader, um, is a DEI Republican, but is in that sort of new generation of Republican leadership. I think you're going to see that generation, Gen X, essentially go to war with millennials. And if you look at the the new generation of the Democratic Party is millennials, right? It's it's AOC. And unfortunately for us on the right, millennials are a much bigger generation. Um, and I think we're in the midst of a, a basically a generational handoff uh, in power from boomers to their children, largely the millennials, in which if Gen X does not assert itself um, very, very firmly, uh, their leadership is going to be lost. And I think that that would be a great shame because they're currently the only generation um, that is possible of inheriting power as boomers let go of it that has kept to any semblance uh, of continuity with the American way of life. And so Gen X, this is my message to you as a millennial. If you don't seize power and get rid of a little bit of that like laid back apathy that is the calling card culturally of Gen X, uh, you are going to be run over by the millennials. And unfortunately, we're all going to suffer for that. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to the group, either about the DEI conservatism and the weak framing of that, um, or about this, this generational war, I think, that's coming between Gen X and millennials. It's interesting. I think back to, I think this was 2018. I was interviewing a primary candidate um, for Senate who I was profiling her, a woman in Wisconsin. And I asked her at one point um, when we were spending the whole day together, we were actually at a baseball game. And I asked her basically about being a mom, being a woman in politics. And I remember her answer I, I remember being disappointed in her answer um, because it was basically just like, well, you know, men don't get these questions and uh, I don't like to think of myself as a woman. Um, I just, you know, women are no different than men, et cetera, et cetera. That kind of response I'm paraphrasing. Um, but in, in the sense that like DEI conservatism to me is sort of defined by that weirdly, which sounds backwards. Um, and it sounds like something Nikki Haley would say too, to me, like that's, a, I relate her with that kind of generation of conservative women who used to say things like, it doesn't matter that I'm a woman and I don't need to talk about being a mom because you don't ask men about their kids, like blah, blah, blah. Um, to me, that feels like identity politics as opposed to just rolling in and being like, 
listen, I prioritized being a mom for 10 years. I didn't work or whatever the answer is. Um, there's something really interesting going on with Nikki Haley's candidacy, because I think she herself is trying to figure out what the right answer is, because she's trying to figure out what the demand is within her potential voter base. <laughs> so that's your Republican primary voters, but also probably your independents who might be tempted to vote in a Republican primary. Um, so I don't want to take up too much of the group's time here, but I do think in, in a weird way, almost punting on identity politics is kind of DEI conservatism too, because it's saying like, I don't need to talk about my identity. I just need to mention it over and over and over again, um, if that makes sense. So I'll kick it over to everyone else. So I savaged Nikki Haley quite badly in my uh, Newsweek podcast that came out yesterday. So I would shamelessly you know, encourage you guys to go ahead and check that out. And I will save some of my more substantive criticisms of her, perhaps for our next segment. But for this DEI conservatism segment, I guess really all I want to do, because I certainly agree with what Inez and Emily have said thus far, um, you know, I, I was listening to her speech and the whole identity politics thing, and it was, you know, it was stridently pathetic. It was galling and irksome, and it was really just awful. But, you know, I, Ryan Gerdusky flagged this interview that Nikki Haley gave with the New York Times back in 2012, and it's really interesting. And apparently, this is not that new for Nikki Haley. So I'm just going to read this real quick. So, in a 2012 interview that Nikki Haley gave the New York Times, she credited Hillary Clinton for her decision to run for office. So this is Nikki Haley now speaking. She says, "Quote." The reason I actually ran for office is because of Hillary Clinton. She said that when it comes to women running for office, there will be everybody that tells you why you shouldn't, but that's all the reasons why we need you to do it. And I walked out of there thinking, that's it. I'm running for office. So uh, with all due respect, th this is literally what we make fun of the left for doing is like, you know, like being there like a zombie and like the political world and be like, oh my God, I'm voting for you because of your genitalia, your skin color or whatever. I, this is such utter crap. I mean, I was literally watching, um, I, be I become a huge fan of the comedian Bill Burr. I don't know if any of you guys are, are, are like stand-up comedy. Bill Burr literally did a stand-up bit about this, but he was mocking lefties. He was mocking feminists. And here's Nikki Haley just saying it. So I, I, I don't know. I, I, I find this all just incredibly noxious. Uh, ben Roon, who I will yield to now, wrote, wrote a fantastic piece for Newsweek recently about anti-wokeism being the glue that holds the Republican Party together. You know, evidently, the Republican Party under Nikki Haley will not be dedicated to anti-wokeism, it seems. Well, it'll hold the Republican Party together if it cares to survive as anything other than a rump, foe, opposition, ruling class organ. Um, and, and I guess I'd just say, you know, as a general matter, uh, DIE, because I really try to refrain from giving DEI the credit of referring to it as DEI. But DIE conservatism is a contradiction in terms, and we should never, ever, ever concede the premises here. We see that it leads to the likes of a George Santos, for example, but just more broadly, this isn't who we are. Uh, and trying to cow to the left's sacred cows on these issues and engage in identity politics of our own is wrong on the merits, it's wrong on the politics, and it's totally inconsistent with our philosophy. But I say our philosophy, clearly many in the Republican Party, particularly in the establishment, cannot get away from what had been. And thankfully, it's out of step with tens of millions of voters, and I think they'll make their voices heard loud and clear going into 2024. So on a 2024 note, that's a perfect transition to our final topic. So Emily, take us home. I was going to say it was like Ben was just reading perfectly from a script. Uh, we have the floodgates starting to open up here when it comes to the 2024 presidential primary. Donald Trump obviously announced just a couple of months ago. Um, and now we have Nikki Haley announcing. We have news that looks like Chris Sununu is flirting very seriously with a run for the presidency. Other people like Larry Hogan um, are are out there kind of talking like they, they might be interested in potentially running for president. Tim Scott looks like he's taking a very, very serious run um, for president. And let us not forget Ron DeSantis, uh, you know, one of the biggest candidates in that race, even he's not uh, announced yet, um, but is, you know, taking a look at it. So all that being said, um, Nikki Haley's had a heck of a week. She's gotten some really big gifts from Don Lemon um, and Wajahat Ali, um, who have just come out and said stupid, stupid things that are both like misogynistic and uh, racist. 
asked about her. So did oh, what did Mary Trump? I think had one too. Um, just massive gifts to her and her ability to do the DEI conservatism thing, as we just talked about. Um, but there are also interesting developments on the Trump front. Front, he's criticizing Ron DeSantis as somebody who followed the Paul Ryan quote club for no growth model uh this is a from a trump truth on truth social um when it comes to entitlement so social security and medicare um and that's a really interesting development Ron DeSantis came out swinging against uh, the kind of blank check to Ukraine policy um, following, you know, that's that follows in line with how Donald Trump has treated it as well. So we're starting to see, I think, the contours with Nikki Haley formally getting into the race, uh, with Trump formally in the race, and with you know, all of these trips that people are taking to New Hampshire uh, and elsewhere starting to pop up left and right, we're really starting to see the contours of the primary forming. It'll be really difficult to know how things shake out without uh, you know knowing whether DeSantis is running, without knowing uh, who else might be throwing their hat into the ring, because you know that's their foils for each other in so many ways, right? Like it made a very big difference, for instance, that Donald Trump was running against Jeb Bush. Uh, it made a very big difference, for instance, that uh, Rand Paul was in there criticizing Marco Rubio, criticizing uh, Chris Christie, criticizing John Kasich. Um, so those contrasts are a really big part of what these races look like. But as these contours emerge, I wanted to toss that open to the group about, uh, you know, with Nikki Haley, we see her criticizing populism, especially populist economics, aggressively. Uh, kind of criticizing populist economics and making it seem, and by the way, I didn't even mention former Vice President Mike Pence, who's also very seriously exploring a run and is talking very seriously about it recently. Um, she's making it seem like she thinks her lane is to critique populist economics. The way to her voters' heart is to split the electorate critique populist economics and scrape everybody over to her side that way and, and get a big enough coalition to win. Mike Pence might be in a similar boat. Sununu is also very moderate on these things, but maybe he just wants to distinguish himself on a temper level, temperamental level, like a vibes level. Um, we'll see. But let me toss it over to the group and say, particularly on this question of entitlements. Is that becoming a wedge issue? Is Ukraine becoming a major issue? Uh, where does this all, or where can we sort of, in our vantage point here, February, 2023, uh, start to see candidates landing? What's going to be important and where should they be on some of those big questions like entitlements? So I, I'm really happy that you mentioned that Nikki Haley has made kind of the whole kind of economic rethinking kind of a centerpiece of her nascent campaign, because I, that is really actually what I want to kind of focus my remarks on right here. So, um, you know, going back to 2021, Nikki Haley gave a speech at the, at the Heritage Foundation. And by the way, the fact that she gave the speech at Heritage then compared to where Heritage is now, where Tucker Carlson is giving their like the keynote address of the 50th anniversary gala in two months. I mean, like really like night and day and, you know, huge kudos to Kevin Roberts. But going back to Nikki Haley's 2021 speech at Heritage, she just went off. She teed off on hyphenated capitalism, on socialism, light on those who would kind of sacrifice our principles. I mean, you know, I genuinely wonder whether Nikki Haley has learned anything whatsoever from the last 20 years of of geopolitics, of geoeconomics. I, I, I bet if you asked her point blank that she would probably still defend China's ascension to the WTO back in 2001, you know, on kind of, you know, on, on economic liberalization leads to political liberalization grounds, you know, kind of the old kind of bipartisan Washington cliche, right? Obviously, that has not panned out particularly well. Um, look, kind of just extrapolating and going to like how the field looks at, at this way too early stage more generally, there's a, there are apparently going to be a lot of very silly campaigns. I, I, I mean, Larry Hogan is doing the Sunday talk shows for God knows what reason. Chris Sununu, who I think has decently high popularity ratings in New Hampshire, but has virtually no national profile whatsoever. I guess he's talking about a wrong. Tim Scott could be the next to announce. Look, as of right now, I mean, this very clearly looks like a two-person race. You know, uh, if if Governor Sanchez does indeed announce, which I, I I do predict that he probably will, not that I have any inside information, but I do predict he probably will. And you know, I, I, everyone else from there, unless like they catch lightning in a bottle, is probably playing some sort of catch-up. But you know, you really have to just sometimes wonder 
what are you putting your family for? I mean, I guess the obvious answer is they want a cabinet position, they want a book deal, they want this, they want that. But, you know, as Inez has aptly said, you know, this is this is silly season right now. And, you know, the good the good stuff will hopefully start within the next few months. <laughs> yeah, on that note, I'll say yes, this is silly season. It's for everybody who has no chance to run for president. They're either running for the VP slot, right, or a cabinet position or just to raise money, raise their national profile. Um, the 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 big winners of, of silly campaign season are obviously the consultants who will walk away uh, sometimes with millions of dollars for campaigns that never break 3%, right? And never had a chance uh, to break 3%. Um, so so that's that's kind of where the field is at now. Um, I, I want to follow up on what Josh said. I, I would call Nikki Haley basically the 2012 autopsy candidate. Um, she follows very, very closely to what the, the establishment of the Republican Party thought was wrong with Romney's campaign, which is apparently um, that he needed to double down on the economic austerity message um, and back off of those those scary, divisive cultural issues. Um, of course, that campaign was a failure uh, and, and Donald Trump won doing essentially the opposite. Um, and as I pointed out many times here and elsewhere, uh, and, and I, I think um, Ben, your column, uh, as Josh mentioned, your column, highlights this yet once again, um, actually cultural issues are the center of the Venn diagram of all the people um, and the various interests and coalitions that I don't even want to call it on the right, but just the not left, right? Um, the culture war is the big tent. We actually have a much big, a better case on cultural issues and anti-wokeness to reach out to the center, to moderates, um, than we do oftentimes on economic issues. This is exactly backwards from the 2012 autopsy, but it seems that Nikki Haley is very much like re-embodying that autopsy and giving it a shot. I don't make political predictions given like I and everybody else uh, in, in this kind of chattering class business uh, were so wrong in 2016. I basically do not make predictions. This is going to be an exception. The, the nominee for the Republican Party will be either Donald Trump or Ron DeSantis. The rest of these people are either in to play spoiler or to raise their profile or to pay consultants a lot of money. They don't have a chance. Um, and and I, I frankly think, uh, especially because we're facing, usually I'd be all in favor of this kind of um, you know, profile raising, a little bit snake oil salesman type, you know, candidates uh, for president. I think rough and tumble American politics is just fine. Um, this time, the issues facing the country are so serious. It, it kind of annoys me to see people like Chris Sinu, Sununu running for president. Um, th this guy is just, he's hes a, a libertarian for a, a libertarian state um, that has absolutely no national relevancy at all. And uh, this is this is this is just a waste of I think of voters' time. But that being said, uh, it, it really is the kickoff for the the campaign season. So I guess we'll be talking about this a lot more in the weeks to come. Yeah, uh, many thoughts on this, but I guess one of the first I'd lead with is how could you look at the 2016 and 2020 presidential elections and then say I'm going to run in the land of anti-populist economics? This has been a national winner even if it was totally disingenuous on the Joe Biden side of things, this has been a national winner twice, at least in terms of kind of the rhetoric involved and some of the associated policies and who the candidates claimed that they were speaking for and showed up obviously in the polling. The notion that you would run against populist economics after what we've seen, uh, it just beggar, it defies belief. It defies all logic, which then leads obviously to that question of, okay, what is the point of these candidacies who are t tacking to positions that are totally out of step with where the public is? And of course, you know, yes, there is the money. There's maybe potentially setting up for a future run down the road, and this is going to up your national profile. Maybe it's that some of these individuals want to be resistance folk heroes. Maybe they are essentially stalking horses for interests who want to use some of these candidates to usefully in debates try and damage or wound some other competitors. You know, I'm thinking of like Christie, Chris Christie going after Marco Rubio, for example. And there are all sorts of that interplay in a big field and you don't know how it's going to play out on the stage. But there are obviously any number of motives behind why some of these individuals are running. But I do think on the substance, I mean, it is interesting to look at and we don't know what the primary issues are going to be from 2023 through 2024 uh, and beyond. But Obviously, you know, where the candidates are on Ukraine, there are really distinguishing positions within the Republican field. And, you know, there's been analysis out there to suggest that Trump's tactic is essentially to take the most anti 
open-ended blank check to Ukraine sort of position. And I am going to negotiate with Russia because, by the way, going back to this pre-even Trump presidency, Trump inauguration, I think the whole idea was to effectuate something of a reverse new Sino-Soviet split. And of course, uh, as a consequence of Russia Gate and the continuation now of establishment policies, you have Russia and China closer, arguably, than they've ever been before, along with Iran, for that matter. Uh, and then you have, I think, combating wokeism. And obviously, that is in large part to the extent he does run. And I think it's likely he will as well. You, know, Governor DeSantis, supposedly, the plan is sort of to announce after the legislative session in Florida, and obviously, you have strong Republican majorities there, plus the governor, he will likely run, of course, on that agenda of combating wokeness in all of its forms. And then Trump will point to his agenda of combating wokeness as an executive. So you're obviously going to have debates over that as well. I really think this notion of you know, debates over the welfare state and its size, scope and nature and what are we going to do about these programs? Yeah, I think that the press wants to create a dichotomy and some kind of rift on this. But I think Republicans know that the voters like these programs. Trump took it off the table as an issue back in 2016. And I don't really see it being an issue going into 24. Maybe some of these other candidates are going to try to raise it, but I don't see how it's going to serve to their benefit. So I too, like Inez, I don't make any prognostications because we're proven wrong all the time and it should humble all of us as pundits. Uh, but it does see, appear to me like it's a two candidate race. So let's go ahead and transition to final thoughts on that note. I, I guess I'll take actually moderator's prerogative and starts off because I kind of have a direct kind of um, line from what we were just talking about there. So my friend Glennon Pappen has an essay out in the New American Affairs Journal, which is always one of my favorite publications. I, I he literally dropped the day before recording, so I actually haven't had a chance to read it yet, but I think I get the gist. Um, the title of the essay is Requiem for the Realignment. And you know, basically, I think what Gladden is saying here is – Something that I have increasingly been thinking as well, and it relates to literally what Ben was just saying, actually, about kind of more populist leaning, kind of two cheers for capitalism, not three cheers. There's been a lot of emphasis, properly speaking, on you know on, on, on waging the culture war with 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 fire, with, with with vigor, all things that I support, you know, obviously, and all things that NatCon I think should support. And there, you know, there obviously is probably no greater figure in the U.S. I think than than Governor DeSantis when it comes to that. Here is the issue. The issue is that we don't want to get kind of the economic kind of bread and butter kind of material issues lost by focusing so you know singularly or exclusively on the cultural issues. And I do worry, you know, I I think that there are some in the GOP donor class. I I have names in mind, but I'm not necessarily going to name them. I, I think that there are some people who probably would kind of uh, would, would, would gladly basically trade just ignoring all of those thorny kind of icky, more populist discussions about kind of reshoring and industrial policy or minimum wage or entitlements. They would gladly do away with that if they can compromise by just attacking woke capital in, in the abstract or kind of things like that. You know, it's, it's much easier put another way. If you're in kind of the hedge fund, Wall Street Journal editorial board class, it's much easier to get away with kind of attacking woke capital, with with attacking DEI, and, and these are bad things. I'm not defending woke capital or DEI, but it's much easier to kind of do that than really kind of getting your hands dirty with with kind of these. Um, I mean, what about kind of you know the conservative case for private sector labor unions to kind of take a, a pristine example? That's probably the best example of them all, I, I, I frankly. So, um, uh, you know, I, I, I'm grateful to Gladden for kind of shedding a, a light on this. And, you know, uh, I, I, Emily, I'm, I'm also grateful for her for kind of bringing up the whole kind of political economy debate in the last segment there, because I'm going to be looking at that very carefully in, uh, you know, in this upcoming presidential primary. Yeah, I want to just say, like, J.D. Vance, there's this been this weird and totally false media narrative that he didn't touch the East Palestine story for days, which is not true. He was on top of that story immediately. And I want to think I want to say, I think that um, an issue like that, there's a there's a huge question of what do the Republican candidates who are running in 2024, what policies would they support that will uh, make the situation right for the people who are victims, but would have prevented the situation from ever having happened at all? Um, and that's a it's it's a very specific issue, but I wanted to 
to bring it up in this context because I think it's a useful thought experiment and can become a useful litmus test because um, if you're still approaching corporations as things that make money uh, because as engines of capital creation that will, based on market forces, almost you know nine times out of 10 be for the common good, then you have no business uh, writing for a president either on the left or the right at this point, because uh, we, sh we should not, as conservatives, support erring on the side of, of companies polluting neighborhoods, screwing regular Americans with ridiculous um, legal agreements, uh, just winnowing their labor support, the labor force down to uh, people having to give 30 days for sick notice. It doesn't matter who who you are or what your company is, that's not a way to treat human beings. And uh, we shouldn't be supporting policies that put more money into the pockets of people who are engaging in buybacks and making obscene uh, amounts of money. Again, I get it. The, I get the greed is good argument. I understand we're all beneficiaries of that. There's no question about it, but corporations exist for the common good. Um, they are you know, given that license by the government. And I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but I'm saying that is the fact. They don't exist to just... Um, you know, make money over hand over fist um, without contributing in a positive way to the country. And so if you're continuing to look at, you know, these these major investor owned railways, et cetera, et cetera, in, in that old light, um, and if you, you wouldn't come to the table in ways that are going to make life better for the average American um, and that in the specific case would make uh, the situation right and would have hopefully prevented it from happening in the first place uh, via, you know, a, a fresh look at regulations that the Department of Transportation um, oversees, you know, every time, speaking of DEI conservatism, every time someone uh, brings up the very real criticisms about Elaine Chow's conflicts of interest, we all have to retreat to our fainting couches and clutch our pearls um, about, you know, how she's a girl boss. Um, and I would, you know, love to see a president appoint a transportation secretary that doesn't have some of those conflicts, whether they're with her own family um, or with just big corporations in general. So uh, that's a long winded way of saying I think East Palestine should be a good litmus test for some of these 2024 candidates and I'll toss it open to everyone else. Um, I'm going to change the subject a little bit, uh, talk about a Ross Douthat column um, that I think is the last reason to click on the New York Times. Um, and it's it's talking about uh, the something that Emily, I know, um, is heavily invested in this debate over hyper novelty and the introduction of the smartphone in 2007 in connection with an explosion of mental health problems, particularly among young girls, but also among young boys. Um, and so it's taking on this Jonathan Haidt thesis uh, about, and which is quite well backed up um, in terms of, of the timeline of when these problems really took off right around 2007. Uh, but I, I think this column is well worth, um, well worth reading because it, it places that moment in the larger cultural context of a, a type of liberalism um, and permissiveness in the culture that had really knocked down all our foundations and our ability to deal with technological shocks. Um, so I think this is something Emily and I sometimes go back and forth a bit about, um, but it, so I think he really does a good job of laying out how hollow the liberalism of the 90s and 2000s actually was uh, and how it was unable to withstand this kind of technological uh, shock. His, his final paragraph of this this column is, if you are comfortable in the world with the world of the early Obama years, it makes a lot of sense to focus on the technological shock that brought us to this place to lament and attempt to alter its effects. But those effects should also yield a deeper scrutiny as well, because what looked stable and successful 15 years ago now looks more like a hollowed out tree standing only because the winds were mild and waiting for the iPhone to be swung gleaming like an axe. Um, I think this is a broader critique that, that goes out to, I mean, something that we are continually critiquing, I think, on this show, uh, this idea of both the center right and the center left, that we can just revert uh, to the 1990s and increasingly what that idyllic period in the 90s and early 2000s actually um, looks like upon closer scrutiny is exactly that, a hollowed out, uh, hollowed out tree that looked on the surface um, to not be yielding the kind of, of horrible slippery slope, slope predictions that the moral majority, right, 
uh, was making at the time. And that now from the benefit of 15 or 20 years later, looking back, actually looks like those slippery slope pr predictions, if anything, were underrated um, or, or, or under um, sort of hyped, right? Uh, that we actually live in a world that is in many ways substantially worse and more terrifying culturally than anything that the moral majority predicted that sounded so outlandish in the 90s. So um, I highly recommend that column. And I think that that kind of reasoning uh, extends out much further than just talking about the iPhone uh, and about technological shocks, but but also just to a general politics that didn't that yielded something that looked okay, essentially only at the top of the world and the end of history for the United States. So, well, on a slightly different note, I just wanted to return to something which you know, the article that Josh alluded to that I wrote on. Uh, Jim Banks and the fight against wokeism um, and something that we've seen kind of crystallize in a whole slew of uh, candidacies and offices, you know, first during the Trump administration, certainly in the DeSantis governorship in Florida, and even in some nascent smaller initiatives in places like North Carolina, where at UNC now there's a battle over uh, the, the gall of these trustees to try and create a school that provides some balance uh, with respect to public discourse. Um, and intellectual work around political issues. I think that uh, one way that we ought to be thinking about conservatives and Republicans nationally is, is that the, the baseline, kind of the bare minimum of a, a litmus test is going about exposing and completely defunding and eradicating wokeism in all of its forms when uh, in political power. But then the next step has to be, again, what affirmatively do we use these institutions for? You know, you're combating a whole lot of rot that goes beyond the state of the institutions, but then the culture that these institutions have helped foster and reinforce, which is also completely at cross purposes with uh, conservatism, with the, the common good, you know, as Josh would define it. So I just think that we should start thinking about as the very bare minimum baseline, the defunding, stripping, firing, getting rid of the civil service protections where necessary and the like. All of that stuff looks radical based upon where we are today and where we've been. But that ought to be kind of the baseline. That's not even the aspirational aspect of what I think ultimately a national conservative agenda ought to look like, because it's mainly a defensive one. And essentially, it it's, a, it's an acknowledgement of the fact that the long march through the institutions is essentially complete. And it's just a question of I guess, how far does it go within each of those institutions? So there not only needs to be kind of the counter march, but then there needs to be a thought about how we actually harness these institutions towards the good. What does that good actually look like? And I think we'll have all manner of uh, vigorous debates on those issues, and we'll probably have lots of intra-party squabbles uh, between and among each other on them. But that that ultimately has to be kind of the, the next step, even though we haven't even gotten close to the eradication of the woke cancer yet. So Inez mentioned the slippery slope, which I remember my first year of law school at, at the University of Chicago, they teach you as a logical fallacy. But uh, the more accurate view of the slippery slope, as the aforementioned Gladden Pepin refers to it, is the capital I iron, capital L law of the slippery slope. It never fails in my experience, for better or for worse. But on that note, guys, this has been a wonderful edition of Natcon Squad. On behalf of Emily, Inez, and Ben, I'm Josh Hammer. We will see you next week.